You want a war? You're gonna get one. Now get the guns, the drugs, from my generation, I'll take the fall. Welcome to episode 151 of Reliving the War. We're back to traditional Monday night head-to-heads, thank God. And tonight we have got Raw coming from San Jose, California, while Nitro's live from Greenville, South Carolina. If you missed the Fall Brawl video, check it out ASAP. It wasn't my favourite pay-per-view of the year, but you know the drill. It'll help make this week's Nitro a bit easier to understand. This week's Jam Master is DJ Ant. Ant mixes it up at the DJ booth wearing his Reliving the War shirt and you just know he's dropping the Cold as Ice remix at every given opportunity. Or at least I hope he is. Thank you very very much Ant for being this week's Jam Up guy. Here we go then, we've got two massive shows this week and we've got a big moment I've been looking forward to covering for a very long time. Let's get started with another episode of Reliving the War. Tony Schiavone reminds fans that we're going to see a Goldberg vs Sting main event tonight. There's also been a lot of rumours going around that the Horsemen are going to reunite on Nitro and what's more, there's also rumours of Ric Flair arriving at the building. Mike Tenay's outside talking to limousine drivers and pilots trying to find out if the Nature Boy has indeed arrived on Monday Nitro, but no one's given anything away. Back in the arena though, the crowd's going absolutely crazy at the mere thought of Ric Flair showing up to Nitro. Who cares about the horsemen? I think they are the worst. I'm here for Alex Wright and his big smelly bratwurst. Two. Oh, big bratwurst. Alex looks like a god tonight, no doubt about it, but what on earth happened to Van Hammer? He's not heavy metal anymore, he's not a makeup wearing grunger anymore either. He's clearly been hanging out with the ultimate warrior and enjoying the big warrior smoke. He watched the giant get whopped out last week and he was like, yeah, I'll have a bag of that Mr. Warrior. Legitimately though, Alex Wright recently said in an interview that he'd be open to returning to American wrestling for an appearance or two, so for the love of all things big and broadverse, Triple H, Tony Khan, whoever it is that can make dreams come true, book this man for guaranteed sellouts across the country. Alex leapfrogs over this unwashed hippie and he gives him some Saturday ride fever before kicking his ass all over the ring. Seriously, Alex has no time for nonsense and he wants to show hippie Hammer who's boss. Hammer comes back with a few body slams before Alex goes to the outside and that's when Ernest Miller shows up. Alex gets back in the ring while Hammer's now on the outside and Ernie knocks Hammer out cold with a kick to the head. The referee throws the match out, Kent gets in the ring and Alex doesn't think Ernest Miller's worth some Saturday ride fever. It's the ultimate insult. Miller grabs the mic, he says no one can beat him and he says he's the greatest. And then Doug Dillinger's team of security goons handcuff Miller to take him away to WCW jail, while Ernest says somebody call my mama. The question is, why doesn't Double D and the security dream team do this when the NWO interfere in matches? Bret Hart wanted some interview time next and his excellency looks a little beaten up after war games. He hobbles to the ring and he says he's made a jackass of himself lately, he trusted the wrong people, and he's now looking to time away from the ring due to injuries sustained at the hands of Stevie Ray and Hollywood Hogan at Fall Brawl. Brett calls Hogan scum, he says he's gonna come after Hulk when he heals up, and Brett also says he shouldn't be holding the US belt right now because he never earned the championship. Roddy Piper then comes out and Brett looks really uncomfortable as the hot rod basically says, I told you so. Piper says Brett hurt a lot of fans who look up to him, he hurt his own parents, but Stu would be proud of Brett's actions tonight and how Brett's owning up to his mistakes. It's now time for Brett to prove to everyone what he is and who he is, and Piper gets a round of booze when he says if the American people can forgive Bill Clinton then they can certainly forgive Bret Hart. Piper walks away and Brett says he hopes everyone can give him a second chance, so it looks like Brett's now officially done with Hollywood Hogan and NWO Hollywood. Saturn, who successfully disbanded Raven's flock at Fall Brawl, had a match against Kendall Wyndham. This was Kendall's first ever Nitro match even though he's been back in WCW for around a year. 
I was pretty surprised that this match went for just under 10 minutes. You usually don't get long matches like this in R1, so it was very much welcomed. Kendall tried to show he belonged on Monday Night Television by trying to get in as much of his stuff as possible, including a chin lock. That seals it for me, book this guy every week. Kendall dominated most of the match, but Saturn ended up winning it with a death volley driver. And then Raven's flock, minus Raven and Canyon, come down to the ring. Raven and Canyon are in the audience, and Raven tells his former faction to join him once again. It's time to jump back over the guardrail and reform the flock after just 24 hours. Saturn tells Riggs he's a former tag team champion. He tells Horace and Sick Boy that they're young and they need to go out and become stars on their own. Lodi's told to go fuck himself essentially, and Saturn calls calls Kidman the most talented person standing in the ring right now and a guy who should go out and win the cruiserweight title. Everyone decides to walk away, the flock won't be getting back together. Lodi seems a little unsure but Kidman convinces him to stay away from Raven, and Saturn tells Raven that it's mind over matter. They don't mind that Raven doesn't matter. Austin, Undertaker, Kane and Mr. McMahon open up Raw with a promo. On Nitro, it's Wrath vs The Renegade. McMahon uses this promo mainly to address fans who didn't tune in to Saturday Night Raw and Sunday Night Heat. He says he's sick of seeing Austin with the WWF Championship, he guaranteed Austin's gonna lose that championship at breakdown, and the match Austin's gonna compete in is a triple threat match, Austin vs Undertaker vs Kane. McMahon then reveals that he and the brothers have a little business agreement going on. McMahon doesn't care much for Kane and The Undertaker, but the brothers agreed to protect Vince McMahon in order to get this title opportunity at the breakdown pay-per-view, and Vince also reveals that The Undertaker and Kane are prohibited from defeating each other in that triple threat match, so essentially it's a two-on-one match. McMahon then delivers his classic screw job line. He says Austin needs to remember that Vince McMahon didn't screw Stone Cold, Stone Cold screwed Stone Cold, and this leads to Austin attacking Vince and the Brothers of Destruction step in to protect the chairman. Austin gets beaten up pretty badly and he ends up taking a double choke slam from Kane and Taker. <laughs> Look at Vince McMahon here. McMahon then demands that Kane and Taker walk back up the ramp with him, and Undertaker tells Steve that this is nothing personal, it's just business. Vince then announces a match for Raw. Austin's gonna defend his WWF Championship in tonight's main event against Ken Shamrock. This Renegade vs Wrath match is only 90 seconds long and it's nothing to write home about. Pure domination from Wrath here is the Renegade's value in WCW continues to plummet. To be honest, it wasn't that high to begin with anyway. Renegade has this match and one more match against Wrath in December before getting let go by WCW, and Wrath wins this match with the meltdown. You're only really going to watch this one to see the finisher. Ooh, the real Double J versus the fake Double J next on Raw. On Nitro, Hollywood Hogan cuts a promo. A few things here. First, the WWF acknowledged the relationship between Road Dogg and Jarrett, so that's good. Second, Jerry Lawler says Billy Gunn's hair must be inspired by Venus Williams, and Jim Ross jokes about no one tuning in for the Venus tennis match. A jab at the USA Network, saying as Raw was doing better in the ratings, yet they still got bumped to Saturday night for two weeks. And lastly, I hope Scott Hall got some royalties for those DX shirts because that was totally a Scott Hall catchphrase in WCW. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. Shut up. Jarrett's out here wanting to prove that it was he who really sang with my baby tonight, but his early attack gets stopped with a shake, rattle and roll. Jarrett comes back with a knee to the midsection, but he gets stopped once again with a back elbow. We see Road Dogg's knee drop and the fake Double J takes an inverted atomic drop before getting his neck snapped on the top turnbuckle. James goes up for a few mounted punches to the back of Jeff's head, but a low blow puts an end to that nonsense. Jeff continues to struggle when building momentum though because his leapfrog teabag completely misses, and to prove he's the real Double J, Road Dog sets Jeff up for the same move, and Jeff gets the back of Rody's balls right on the head. Southern Cyborg Justice then pull Road Dog out of the ring, X Pog and Billy run over to help out, and Mr. Ass ends up breaking the guitar over Dennis Knight's head, meaning Jarrett has to attack Road Dog back in the ring with a broken weapon. Jarrett wins via pinfall, so that settles it. Jarrett is the real Double J, and the Road Dog's nothing but a poser. We're then informed that an evening gown match is going to take place on Raw tonight. It's Jackie vs Sable. 
On Nitro, Eric says that Flair isn't here, but Eric Bischoff is. The crowd didn't like that too much. Hulk calls Bret Hart a sissy and a man who's never been in Hogan's league to begin with, and then Hogan moves on to the Ultimate Warrior. Hollywood's doing that delusional thing where he says his opponents are afraid of him. He says Warrior scared and Warrior, along with everyone else apparently, watched Hogan beat everyone up in war games last night. Warrior snuck up on Hogan and he had to get in a cheap shot, and it's Warrior's fault that Hogan won't be getting a title shot against Bill Goldberg at Halloween Havoc. Hollywood then says, and I quote, I'm gonna send you back to where no man ever came from. Yeah, and Hogan challenges Warrior to a match in Las Vegas. Hogan vs Warrior one more time. The ring then fills up with Warrior's homegrown Ratchet and Dank and the boys have a puff. When the purple haze clears, the booty man has vanished. Ed Leslie's left Earth, he's travelled to another dimension of existence, and Hulk Hogan just lost his bestest friend in the whole wide world. Ah yes, Hoovy vs Kidman on Nitro, that's what I'm talking about. On Raw, we've got The Rock vs Kane, that's also what I'm talking about. There's some dissension in the nation tonight, Rock tells the guys to know their roles and take up their positions around the ring and at the entranceway, but the faction aren't too happy about being told what to do. So The Rock says he's gonna go out there all alone and face Kane without backup. Keep in mind, The Undertakers came out to support his little brother. Rock lays in the right hands at the opening bell, but he goes down after a back elbow. Rock tries to go toe to toe with the big red machine, but he doesn't get very far, so he slides under the ring when Kane goes for a big boot. Throwing down with Kane isn't the way to go here. Rock grabs Kane's food and he's able to do some damage at the apron. The former IC champ also utilizes the ring post to his advantage. And back in the ring, Rock slows Kane down with a few kicks to the knee, followed by a clothesline that makes the crowd pop. But Kane comes back with a big power slam and the damage the Kane's knee has been completely forgotten about. After taking a big boot, Rock gets punished in the corner. The Undertaker watches on as his little brother body slams his opponent, and Kane then goes up to the top rope for a diving clothesline. It's not looking too good for the people's champ. Rock gets choked in the corner and when he tries to fight back, he gets put down with a clothesline. Kane then goes for a back body drop but it gets countered by Rock and we see a crowd pleasing float over DDT. The audience gets all fired up as Rocky starts laying in the right hands. Rock brings it all the way to the corner and it looks like Rocky now has a chance. Kane takes a swinging neck breaker in the middle of the ring. He tries to lift Rock up for a tombstone but this leads to a referee bump just before Rock has a chance to counter with a Russian leg sweep. The elbow pad comes off and the crowd rise to their feet for the people's elbow, but then The Undertaker gets in the ring to help out the big red machine. Rock takes a few shots before getting sent to the outside, and then we see Mankind for the first time since SummerSlam. Mankind whacks Kane with a sledgehammer before running off again. The Undertaker gives chase, but this allows Rock to cover Kane, and Rock wins on Raw's War. It's a big win here for Rocky, and the reaction he got from the crowd in San Jose was nothing short of excellent. Undertaker grabs a mic and he says, it's time to settle it once and for all. The dead man wants a match with Mankind tonight and Taker invites Foley to bring his sledgehammer too. Backstage, Mankind accepts the challenge. He says he's been working on a few scientific moves and he'll be more than happy to demonstrate those moves in the ring tonight on Raw's War. On Nitro, Billy Kidman comes to the ring with no entrance music, but he'd end up with a banger soon enough. Hoovy wants to prove he's more popular than Kidman by posing on the turnbuckles after the opening bell, and this totally has the opposite effect on me. I now hope that Kidman kicks his ass. Billy starts off well, and he too gives the fans a chance to cheer for him before going through a drop down leapfrog sequence that sees Hoovy come out on top. Guerrero delivers 10 mounted punches in the corner, and Kidman hits the mat following a missile dropkick. Hoovy then poses in the corner again, and it's a little heelish what he's doing here, isn't it? He's got a smug look on his face as he invites Kidman back inside the ropes, and he pays for it when Kidman delivers a slingshot head scissor takedown. Hoovy takes a power slam, and we then see some chin abuse from BK. The two get up, and Guerrero delivers a lightning quick head scissor takedown before sending Kidman and himself over the top rope with a running crossbody. Nitro then takes a commercial break, we come back to see the former smackhead applying a chin lock, and yeah, new favourite wrestler, Kidman's awesome, and if you don't believe me, there's chin lock number 2. Hoovy lands on his feet following a German suplex attempt, but he ends up taking a sit down spine buster. Guerrero kicks out, so Kidman performs a wheelbarrow suplex, and again, it's a kick out of two. Guerrero tries to win it with a German suplex, followed by a diving head scissor takedown, but he can't keep Kidman down, and yeah, this is really good. 
Kidman counters a Hoovy driver with a reverse suplex. The fans think it's all over, but Guerrero kicks out. Hoovy stops Kidman from hitting the seven year itch with a top rope Frankensteiner. In the crowd boos Hoovy as he looks to finish it with a 450. Kidman grabs Hoovy in mid air for a sit down powerbomb, and Hoovy lands right on his lower back. That looked painful. But Kidman gets himself up to the top rope for the shooting star press, and we have got ourselves a new cruiserweight champion on WCW Nitro. Another good match between these two, their Nitro matches were better than their one pay per view encounter, but yeah there you have it, the Kidman era has begun in the WCW cruiserweight division. Saturn shows up and he applauds Kidman like a proud father. That's my boy Billy, that's my boy. Backstage Mean Gene finds JJ Dillon wearing a tuxedo, Gene wants to know if that was Ric Flair who just walked through the door, Mean Gene wants to get the first interview with the nature boy if indeed he is here tonight, but Dillon says he wants Mean Gene to be surprised like everyone else. Meanwhile Eric Bischoff and Eddie Guerrero were having a meeting outside the restroom, they were going to do this in the restroom but that would have been a bit weird wouldn't it? Eddie wants Eric to release him from his contract and Eric's not prepared to do it. As a matter of fact, Bischoff sending Eddie over to Japan for a tour because Easy e doesn't want to look at Guerrero while he's still employed by WCW. Eddie tells Eric to remember one thing, what goes around comes around. Dustin Reynolds cuts a promo next on Raw, on Nitro the British Bulldog takes on the Barbarian. Dustin's in the ring complaining about the content found on Raw's war these days. He says the WWF stained with vulgar language, aggression and sex. All things that Val Venus seems to enjoy. Val needs to remember, he is coming and when he gets here Mr Venus will repent. Venus shows up on the entranceway and Val's not sure if he should repent for working hard or playing hard if you smell what the big Valboski's cooking. Val wants to show Goldust his latest movie, it's called The Preacher's Wife. The video gets played on the Titan Tron and this looks familiar doesn't it? It's not Mrs Yamaguchi down there bobbing on the knob, no it's Marlena. Dustin breaks down and he gets on his knees and Val says getting on the knees must run in the family. But you know, wasn't it Dustin who told Marlena to hit the bricks because at the time Dustin found Luna? Still good times on Raw, the big Valboski doing the dirt, you love to see it. What you don't love to see is the British Bulldog trying to wrestle a match just 24 hours after the fall brawl trapdoor incident. He was already turning that weird purple colour when walking to the ring and although he's putting on a brave face, his back progressively gets worse throughout this matchup. Davey hits a jumping shoulder block to start things off followed by a clothesline that sends Barbie out of the ring. Barbarian brings Davey out for a few knife edge chops and then Davey gets thrown into the ring steps and that's him completely wrecked. Worse still, he gets his back rammed into the ring post. Back in the ring it looks like Davey wants to stay on the mat for as long as possible but there's only so much Barbarian can really do. Even kicking out of a pin attempt seems to cause Davey a lot of problems. So the match comes to an end when Barbarian sends Davey to the corner for a few strikes and Jimmy Hart gets in on the action. Jimmy also saves Barbarian from getting slammed, so Davey takes him out and have a look at Davey's winning power slam. It's so grim. Davey wins via pinfall and he winces all the way back up the entrance way. Why this man was booked to wrestle tonight is an absolute mystery and you'd hope someone backstage watched this match and told Davey to go home for a while, but that doesn't happen. Steve Regal's getting repackaged on WWF television, you guys will remember this well. It's Steven Regal, a man's man, a real man's man. Apparently Regal's now an outdoorsman who likes to walk around and chop wood. He may be a man, but is he more manly than Ming? Is he a Mingly man? I'm not sure he is. Next we have Triple H vs Owen Hart on Raw, on Nitro JJ Dillon and the Ultimate Warrior cut promos. This match on Raw's War is one we've seen quite a few times so I'm not going to go into detail but let's go over it briefly. The main portion of the match featured Owen Hart in the driver's seat, the crowd broke out in a few loud nugget chants as the Blackheart hit Triple H with a belly to belly suplex, an enziguri and an elbow drop from the second rope, but Triple H wouldn't stay down. Owen then switched it up by locking in a sleeper but Hunter got out with a back suplex and this led to Triple H going on offense very briefly. Triple H performs the face breaker knee smash, he brings Owen to the corner but he ends up taking a low blow. China gets on the apron just as Owen hits a spinning wheel kick and Owen then gets distracted by China, X-Pac and Mark Henry fighting on the outside. Henry takes care of X-Pac no problem but a forearm from China knocks the big man back. 
Triple H takes advantage here and Owen gets hit with a pedigree, and DX's leader wins another one on Raw. Mark Henry wants to fight Axe Pac, and seeing as Pac only weighs about a buck oh five, Henry's gonna let his girlfriend China team up with Waltman, so that's a two on one match we're gonna see a little later on. Over on Nitro, JJ Dillon says Scott Steiner and Buff Bagwell embarrassed themselves last night after what they did in the Steiner vs Steiner grudge match at Fall Brawl. WCW though are unable to punish Scott seeing as he did show up for the match, but what the committee can do is book yet another Scott Steiner vs Rick Steiner match for Halloween Havoc. So it's made official, Rick vs Scott once again, there's no stipulations added here and there's no safeguards in place to make sure the match actually takes place, but let's wait it out and we'll see what happens. The arena lights then begin to flicker and someone or something begins laughing. <laughs> the laugh tracks play it over and over again and this can only mean one thing, the warrior sharing some of his sweet warrior brownies backstage, freshly baked by George W. Kush. Speaking of Warrior, Jim Neidhart was supposed to come out next to wrestle someone from the NWO, but Warrior gives him a blast of the Afghani rocket fuel. The Warrior then shows up in the ring holding a totally baked disciple, who Warrior found passed out backstage with six hot dogs shoved in his mouth. NWO Hollywood come out and Warrior says, and I quote, Hogan, in our lives we can choose to live as warriors or live as ordinary men. In war games, your actions as an ordinary man has only engraved the purpose of the OWN revolution upon the mind of the warriors who will find the courage. <sighs> yeah, Warrior says, a disciple who stands behind a dictator cowers in fear. Warrior accepts the Halloween Havoc challenge and before disappearing he says the graveyards are filled with cowardly, crumbling, conquerable men. Swear to god, Warrior needs to lay off those left handed cigarettes because he talks absolute horseshit at the best of times. Disciple disappears with Warrior again, clearly old brood eye wants to keep this party going. Mankind vs The Undertakers are next match on Raw, on Nitro, Silver King and Norman Smiley take on Big Papa Pump Scotty Steiner. Mankind comes to the ring with some toys he found backstage, he's also got his trusty sledgehammer. The Undertaker brings his own sledgehammer to the ring too and he's also got Kane for backup. Kane isn't looking too hot though after taking that shot earlier on. Foley's able to apply the mandible claw right at the opening bell when Tim White takes his sledgehammer away. Taker falls out of the ring and the two end up fighting beside a dumpster that I'm gonna guess has someone waiting inside. Undertaker stops Mick from using a ladder and the two end up on the other side of the ring where Undertaker focuses on Mick's left hand. Mick injured his hand at Summerslam when trying to protect his face, and things heat up a bit when Taker uses the ring steps to great effect to do even more damage. Undertaker sets a table up against the apron and Foley gets launched into it. The Deadman then throws the table onto Foley's head before the two get back in the ring, and inside the ropes the Undertaker lays in a few hard shots while trying his best to mess up Foley's face even more than what it already is. The Undertaker manages to remove Mankind's mask before the match goes back to the outside. Undertaker lines up a shot with his sledgehammer but Foley moves out of the way. Only problem is he walks right into Kane and the big red machine throws poor Mankind into the timekeeper's table. Undertaker tries to attack again with his sledgehammer and Foley's smart enough to grab a chair and head back in the ring. He then waits for the dead man to get back inside the ropes and Foley takes advantage by hitting his opponent a few times with that chair. The Undertaker is able to get a boot up though and the match ends when Undertaker hits Mankind with a choke slam followed by a tombstone. After the tombstone the rock shows up from inside the dumpster and he takes the phenom out with a chop lock. He then grabs Mick Foley and he throws him over the guardrail for his own safety. And the brothers of destruction end up following the rock back up the entranceway. The match is ruled as a no contest, but the WWF still accomplished quite a lot in this match. It's now been established that The Rock may have a heart and he's prepared to help others who are not part of the nation, and it's also been made clear that The Undertaker is as ruthless as ever. This is a new Undertaker we're dealing with folks and he likes to mess people up. A 2 on 1 match takes place next on Nitro and I asked you guys on Twitter and on the YouTube community page to come up with a name for this tag team of Norman Smiley and Silver King. We have got the King Wigglers, Silver Smiles, Wiggle and Giggle, Mavug Dojo Dropouts, Silver Filler, Good Sportsman, I'm giving the point to Raw this week, The King and his Norman Conquest, Norman Reigns, The, bu <laughs> the Budgie Smugglers, the ideal team for Battlebone 1998, Too Shit to Quit, John Smile and the Man Who Stole It, Great Value High Energy, 
the smiling kings makes more sense than the one warrior nation what's on raw bring your student to work day when high voltage isn't available my 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 two lovely uncles kings of the ymca the heavenly nobodies lwo latino wiggle order the artist formerly known as unknown and we've got screaming biggles mcwiggles and the silver chilled king of sea shows <laughs> Scott's not in the mood to mess around tonight. He takes out Silver Chilled from the apron and Biggles McWiggles takes a clothesline too. The two then take turns at getting kicked in the head by the big bad booty daddy and even Buff Bagwell gets in on the action. It's nothing but a complete beatdown here and keep in mind too, Norman and Silver King were featured on pay-per-view just last night. They both took losses and now they're getting completely dismantled again on Nitro. Scott stacks him up in the corner and he puts Smiley down with a gorilla press slam. He then double underhook powerbomb Silver King on top of Smiley and there's no way to do that safely is there? We then see a double Steiner recliner from Big Papa Pump and the match is over. Steiner wins via submission. I'm all for dominant performances like this but it has to be against the right people. I don't think Silver King and Norman deserve to get whipped this badly on TV but sure, still fun seeing a double Steiner recliner. Maybe next time the Latino wiggle order can be successful. Gangrel vs Edge on Raw, Jan vs Ming on Nitro. Two pretty short matches here. We still don't know anything about Edge and Gangrel's past, but by the looks of things, Edge wants to beat up Gangrel pretty bad. Gangrel stops a downward spiral, but Edge stays on WWF's resident vampire with a reverse electric chair drop. The two get to their feet and they perform a few standing switches before Gangrel pulls off a trapping suplex. This then gets followed up with a tagger suplex. The hits keep coming as Edge takes a bulldog but Gangrel goes to the well one too many times and he ends up getting crotched on the top rope before taking a top rope neck breaker. Edge then performs a body slam before going upstairs but his top rope splash completely misses and our match ends when Gangrel gets sent to the outside and Edge risks it all with a dive over the top rope. Again Edge misses and Gangrel's happy to just do some more damage here and walk away without actually winning the match. So Edge takes an impaler and the referee counts both men out. Gangrel says that his blood's flowing through Edge and eternity is forever. Very nice. You hear Ming vs the Giant and you think of two big boys going to war with a ton of big par moves but it doesn't quite work out that way. Still though, it's pretty fun. It starts with Ming laying in those open palm strikes and the two men share knife edge chops. Ming then tries the usual cut him down at the knees routine that most try against the Giant but he then remembered he's Ming and the two just slug it out. Neither man gets the upper hand but the Minger sure does look ready for more. The Giant gets kicked in the face, the two then begin slugging it out again before the Giant brings his opponent to the corner for a few more chops. Ming just refuses to feel pain tonight though and the Giant backs off. So the two just throw down again in the middle of the ring, there's nothing fancy here, it's just a fight. Another kick stuns the Giant, Ming signals for the death grip, but the Giant has better reach than Ming and there will be no death grip in tonight my friend. Giant wins with a choke slam. It was short, it was pretty wild, and I think it's exactly what it needed to be. China and X Pac take on Mark Henry next on Raw. On Nitro, it's Scott Hall vs Lex Luger. China wants to start the match off, but Jack Don't thinks X Pac should begin. Mark and Kid lock up, and oh, that's pretty awesome. X-Pac gets his wits about him and we see Dilo coming down the ringside. It's only fair seeing as Triple H is here too. And when the match resumes, X-Pac gets punched hard in the face. Southern Justice and Double J show up for a closer look as Mark misses a corner charge. X-Pac's able to chop the big man, Mark takes a kick to the head, and Triple H then grabs a chair seeing as things are getting a bit dicey on the outside. When X-Pac fails the suplex Mark Henry, China comes in to lend a hand. The crowd pops when the degenerates pull off the move and it's not a half ass suplex either, that too looked pretty awesome. Mark kicks out of X-Pac's cover and Kid takes a corner clothesline. Mark then launches Pac high in the air and already I want to see more Mark Henry vs X-Pac matches. The way Mark manhandles Waltman is absolutely insane. China then gets a blind tag and she takes Mark down for a few mounted punches. The crowd goes nuts as China lays in a forearm before tagging out again, and X Pac lands a spinning wheel kick before delivering the Bronco Buster. This match has been surprisingly good. China gets tagged in again, but Dilo holds her foot on the outside. So X Pac hits Dilo with a baseball slide, and China goes upstairs for a crossbody, only to get caught out and par slammed by the world's strongest man. Mark Henry wins, and yeah, this was a lot of fun, and just like Ming 
vs Giants, it was given just the right amount of time. On Nitro, Scott hasn't sobered up from last night. He gets in the ring and he stumbles through his survey and you've got Tony Schiavone saying WCW doesn't condone any of this and he apologizes to fans at home. Lex comes to the ring and Scott trolls him a bit. He then misses the signature toothpick throw, something that surprises Lex and Charles Robinson. And Scott continues to mess around while Lex wants to know what the hell Scott's playing at. Scott complains that Lex's arms have too much oil and he can't get a grip. He then stumbles around when trying to move from a side headlock to a hammerlock. And he then says, work with me Lex, while smiling. The audience aren't buying into this at all by the way and we're on the brink of fans booing both men out of the building. Scott goes to the apron to get a drink and he then falls on his face when trying to get back inside. The referee lets the match continue on and Scott has more fun when he and Lex counter each other's hip toss attempts. The crowd are now booing the match. The two go for a lockup. Scott just falls on the mat. He then rolls out of the ring laughing and things must be bad when Vincent's acting like the voice of reason. When standing on the apron, Scott counts along with Charles Robinson and when Scott and Lex lock up, Lex brings Scott to the corner where he doesn't even fight him. He instead warns Scott that he's about to lose his job and he needs to get his act together. Eric Bischoff then comes out and the match gets stopped. Eric pulls Scott out of the ring and he tells him he can't save him from everything. He needs to go back to the locker room and he needs to sort himself out. Kevin Nash then comes down to the ring along with Conan. Nash wants to talk to his friend, but Scott gets defensive and he begins begins arguing, wondering where Nash was when Scott needed him the most. Scott then says that everyone surrounding him at the moment drinks and they're all hypocrites. He then takes another swig and he throws up on Eric Bischoff. It ends with Scott getting in the ring, he tells his fans to get lost and I'll say it again, this storyline was absolute bullshit and I don't say that just as a Scott Hall fan, if it was anyone who had the same issues going on then I'd say the same thing. The WWF presents an evening gown match, Jackie vs Sable. On Nitro, it's the return of the Four Horsemen. The good thing about these bikini contests or these evening gown matches is the fact that I don't really need to cover them with any kind of detail whatsoever unless you want deep discussions about the clothing the competitors are wearing. I also can't really show much of it either because the video would get pulled down from YouTube. It's just a cat fight really. Towards the end, Sable pulls off a weak Sable bomb and she removes the rest of Jackie's clothing. And to keep the young male demographic happy, Sable also removes her evening gown after the final bell. Nothing you haven't seen before. And nothing you can't check out on the internet if you're really that desperate. The camera did zoom in on this lady sitting in the audience though, most of you will know who this is and for those who don't, she's going to become part of the WWF roster very soon. Right, here we go. JJ Dillon comes to the ring first and he wants Arn Anderson to walk down the ramp. The atmosphere is already insanely good and the crowd knows that something big's gonna go down. The enforcer joins Dillon and Dillon gives Anderson an apology for the things he said to him on TV. JJ says he meant well but a friend shouldn't say the things that Dillon said and Arn accepts his friend's apology. Anderson asks Dylan if he can smell it. 15,000 people blowing the roof off the arena. That's what a pop smells like. I love it. The enforcer says tonight's a new beginning for the horseman. And at the beginning, when people would ask Arn what he wanted to do when he grew up, he always said he wanted to be a pro wrestler. In the mid 80s, Arn's life changed forever when he became a horseman. He was able to wrestle the best wrestlers in the world and a lot of doors opened up for him thanks to his association with the most elite group in pro wrestling history. A year ago, Arn woke up from the operating table and the wrestler Arn Anderson was dead. Arn couldn't be a horseman if he couldn't be a wrestler, and the first man to tell him that something could still happen within the horseman stable was Chris Benoit. Arn introduces three horsemen. The first is Steve McMichael, the second is Chris Benoit, and the third is a man who's never represented the horseman in the past, it's Dean Malenko. So the Iceman is now officially in the group. Arn puts all three men over. He says Benoit's intensity makes him something special and Arn could see it from day one. Mongo's hard headed and hard to be around sometimes but he's all man and he's all pro. As for Malenko, Dean represents what being a horseman's all about. Overachievement and being the best you can be every day of your life. The enforcer says he's proud and a little misty eyed to call Dean a member of the group. 
Arn then says he's doing as everyone requested, he's bringing back the horsemen, he won't be responsible for what happens next and folk should be careful about what they wish for. You know, I get accused of getting wrecked in the head a few times and having a little touch of Alzheimer's. My God, I almost forgot the fourth horseman, Ric Flair, go down here! The pop's insane. I haven't saw a pop like this in WCW for a very long time. Now, I have to play this promo. This is my favourite Nitro promo ever and it's one I can't do justice. You need to hear it for yourself. I kinda shoot myself in the foot doing this because I won't get paid for this video now and I'll have to fight to keep it up after a few days but you know what, it's worth more to let this play out. An emotional Ric Flair walks out as the pop sustains throughout the whole entrance. He gets in the ring and he hugs his fellow horsemen, giving Arn an extra long hug while the crowd continue to lose their minds. Here's the promo, a promo that Ric Flair cuts with a legitimate gleam in his eye. I'm almost embarrassed by the response, but when I see this, I know that the 25 years that I spent trying to make you happy every night of your life was worth every damn minute of it. Somebody told me that the horsemen were having a party tonight in Greenville. Could that be true? That the most elite group that Eric Bischoff said was dead is alive and well. Bischoff, this might be my only shot. And I gotta tell you, I'm gonna make it my best. Is this what you call a great moment in TV? It's wrong because this is real. This is not bought and paid for. It's a real life situation. The night in Columbia, South Carolina, when you look at me, tears in my eyes, and said, God, that's good TV. It was real. Art Anderson passed the torch. It was real, damn it! You think Sting was crying in the dressing room like I was on TV if it wasn't real? This guy, my best friend, is one of the greatest performers to ever live, and you, you squashed him in one night. Then you get on the phone and tell me, disband the horsemen, they're dead. Disband the horsemen. Me, you know what? I looked at myself in the mirror the next day and I saw a pathetic figure that gave up and quit. And for that, I owe you, the wrestling fans, I owe these guys an apology because it won't happen again. We're real and fish off for no matter what you think. Yeah, no, you're not shit. You're an old buried asshole. That's right. You're an obnoxious. You're an obnoxious, overbearing ass. Abuse of power. You. Abuse of power. Cut me off. Come on. You will it's never, ever wrestle my car. Abuse of power. You suck. You, I hate your guts. I hate I your guts. Oh. Your history. You are a liar. You're a 
a cheat, you're a scam, you are a no good son of a bitch. How do you follow that? Well, we'll try. Austin vs Shamrock on Raw, Goldberg vs Sting on Nitro. Austin goes on offense the moment he steps in the ring. Shamrock's able to keep his cool and put Stone Cold down with a jumping leg lariat followed by a clothesline. The challenger then applies a side headlock and he's able to keep it in while Austin tries his best to fight out. Kenny Boy then gets a chance to apply the ankle lock but Stone Cold gets out of the ring. Sensei Blackman has definitely taught Shamrock well. Austin wraps Shamrock's leg around the ring post and he remains aggressive back inside the ring. Shamrock gets suplexed numerous times and Austin applies a headlock of his own. And just like Shamrock earlier on, Steve's able to keep it applied while Ken tries his best to fight out. Shamrock fires back with a jumping back elbow and the two get to their feet. We then see a fisherman suplex from Shamrock but Austin kicks out at two. Stone Cold's able to counter a Hurricane Rana attempt with a power bomb, and you know what? It's refreshing seeing Austin fight someone like Ken. He's been having matches with heavier dudes like Foley, Kane and Undertaker so this match is playing out quite differently thanks to the wrestling style of his opponent. There's a chin lock from the Texas Rattlesnake, Shamrock fights out only to take a knee in the midsection, Stone Cold then goes for a Boston Crab but Shamrock twists out of it and Stone Cold instead goes for a sleeper. Ken then applies a sleeper of his own and Austin breaks it up in the corner. Stone Cold goes for a superplex but he takes a headbutt instead. He's still able to stop a middle rope double axe hand but he can't stop a crossbody from Shamrock. We then see chinlock number 2 from Austin and when the match goes to the outside it's Ken Shamrock who does all the damage. Austin has no luck whatsoever fighting on the floor and when the two get back in the ring Shamrock stays on Austin with a chokehold. Austin takes a clothesline followed by a suplex. Shamrock's the one who ends up applying that Boston Crab. Stone Cold makes it to the ropes. The rattlesnake then delivers a low blow. Austin stomps a mud hole in Shamrock as the crowd goes crazy. This has been a great main event right here. Unfortunately, it's here where it ends with both men going down after a double clothesline. Austin covers Ken but The Undertaker and Kane show up to attack both competitors. Shamrock takes a choke slam from The Undertaker while Kane beats up Austin and then backup arrives. It's The Rock and Mankind. Austin goes to the outside to grab a chair while Foley and Rock go to work on the brothers. McMahon watches on from the entranceway as Austin hits Taker and Kane with chair shots to the head and Raw ends with Austin going after McMahon while Vince escapes back through the curtain. A good main event. Shame about the finish, but you don't need to guess anymore if Rock's not a babyface. He most definitely is. DDP, the winner of War Games, joins the commentary team for this Nitro main event. He's highly interested in who wins this match. He also welcomes Ric Flair back before we cut over for the entrances, and I'd actually say the fans are cheering more for Goldberg tonight. The champion starts off very strong with knee strikes to the midsection followed by a massive power slam. Sting then gets sent to the corner but he moves out of the way and he's able to power slam Goldberg into the opposite turnbuckles. Forget what I just said, they're going wild for the stinger tonight. Sting then suplexes Goldberg, Goldberg no sells it, and Sting gets a little freaked out so he gets himself out of the ring. Tony Schiavone announces that Nitro's just went into overtime and TNT won't be switching shows as Sting gets back inside the ropes and the two men circle the ring. More knee strikes from Goldberg leads to Sting trying to exchange blows with the champ but that was a mistake. Goldberg floors the challenger but Sting repays Bill with a dropkick. A dropkick that Goldberg no sells before delivering his rolling leg lock. Sting's now frustrated, he needs to get his head in it. He applies a headlock and he keeps it in even after taking a backdrop. He then goes for a corner tornado bulldog but Goldberg throws him away and it's evident that Sting just can't build momentum against this guy. Goldberg's just too much. The two go for a test of strength and Goldberg shows off his traps while Sting fails to overpower his opponent. Sting makes it to the corner and the match resets again and this time Sting counters a pile driver and we see a tombstone. Goldberg's dazed. Sting's able to hit three stinger splashes and Sting's quick enough to avoid a spear. It really feels like Sting has a chance to win the belt as he applies the scorpion deathlock and here we go. 
Goldberg tries to break free, but Sting keeps it locked in. Goldberg's now struggling and you're just waiting for him to tap out, but then Hollywood Hogan appears. How many times have I said that during reliving the war? The death locks in deep as Hogan gets in the ring. Sting takes a kick to the back of the head and Billy Silverman doesn't see it, and that's when our match ends. A spear and a jackhammer leads to Goldberg winning the Nitro main event, and I think this was Goldberg's best match up until this point. Hogan attacks Goldberg after the final bell and this leads to Bret Hart running down. Hollywood runs away from Bret and Nitro fades out as Bret and Goldberg tend to sting. Two good main events this week and two matches you should definitely check out. You know what, I went into this one thinking Nitro was going to win because I love that Horseman promo so much, but I gotta be honest, Raw was great this week too. The Undertaker vs Mankind match, Kane vs Rock, Shamrock vs Austin, the WWF came back to Monday night wanting to put on an excellent show and they succeeded. Nitro had the Horseman, a great Hoovy vs Kidman match and a surprisingly decent main event too. I'm calling it a tie this week, I really feel you shouldn't miss either show from September 14th 1998 and I can't pick one over the other. WWF one, WCW one and wrestling fans of this era had a great Monday night. It's these weeks where you look back and realise it'll probably never be like this again. 17 ties are now on the board, Raw has 70 points, Nitro's on 64. In the TV ratings Nitro scored a 4.5, Raw scored a 4.0. Next week on Nitro, the Disciple still completely chonged, the Four Horsemen address Eric Bischoff in the ring, and the Wolfpack compete in a tag team main event against NWO Hollywood. On Raw, the Women's Championship gets reintroduced and a new champion gets crowned, Sergeant Slaughter takes on Al Snow, sounds interesting, and we've got a triple threat main event featuring The Rock, Mankind and Ken Shamrock. Thanks for watching as always guys, and I'll see you all next week, take care. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, shut up. <laughs>